Welcome to 100 Words or Less, the podcast. I am your host, Ray Harkins, and I'm sure some of you are asking yourself, wait, isn't this called First World Problems, the podcast? Shouldn't Ray be introducing Joey and Scott? Well, some things have changed. Basically, things got really busy. As some of you could tell, we hadn't released an episode under the First World Problems moniker for quite some time, and it just came to be that we are breaking up, but not breaking up as friends, of course. So I decided to move on, focus in on the band interview portion of the show, Um, still have Joey and Scott pop in occasionally, and we can talk about music and movies and all that type of stuff, but now the show is going to focus more on, like I said, the interviews, getting to know these dudes who play in bands or people involved in independent culture a little bit more. If you have any feedback, I'd love to hear it. The email address is 100wordspodcast at gmail.com. Our Twitter handle is at 100wordspodcast. So give us some feedback. Let me know if you think this sucks. My first guest was a guest on First World Problems in the early days. And I wanted to bring him back because uh, his band is doing their farewell tour coming up. I sat down with uh, Riley Breckenridge, the drummer of the band Thrice, and a longtime friend of mine. And uh, this is what transpired. One of the things that I'm going to enjoy about this is like, you know, people like yourself who I've known for years, it's like there are very rare times where it's like you're able to sit down and be like, I don't know where you were born. I don't know, like, your upbringings and everything like uh-huh. that, just because it's, like, you know, in the context of where we meet and where we're able to hang out, it's, like, you know, at a show, it's, like, that's not yeah. a private environment to be, not like, normal. <laughs> yeah. Hey, normal. so where is everything? Yeah. So with that, like, you know, where were you always born and raised in Southern California? And, like, what, mm-hmm. how did that all, how did that come about? <laughs> um, Besides your parents deciding to have a child. Yeah, born in Garden Grove. Okay. My parents lived in Westminster for, I think, a year. Mm -hmm. And then we moved to Irvine when I was one, I guess. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you were Irvine. Raised in Irvine, like when Irvine was nothing. Right. And like not chock full of planned communities and stuff. When it wasn't owned by the Irvine company? Mine is still... Maybe just like started. But they were just like, hey, we're going to turn this into a massive suburbia. Yeah. But um, yeah, I've lived in Irvine um, in a little apartment for a couple years and then moved into a new um, housing community called The Terrace, which is like right off of University and Michelson. Oh, okay. Like across the street from Strawberry Farms. and then Oh, yeah, yeah. Like a, 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 like a Ralph's or something there, but sure. um, yeah. And then went to school at Vista Verde elementary <laughs> K through eight. Nice. Uh, year round school. And, um, Oh, year was year round school. You, yeah. Was that a good experience? I loved it. Cause we got like three weeks off in the spring and three weeks off in the fall and, uh, three weeks off in the winter. And then I think like five or six weeks off in the summer. I, I always remember being places and seeing, like, being jealous of kids that went to year-round school and be mm-hmm. like, they get to go places, like Disneyland, for example, where mm-hmm. it's like, obviously, if you were going during the traditional breaks, yeah, it was it's fucking packed. Mad house. Yeah. And it's like, you have the ability to be like, all right, like, I can go a week after you guys go back to yeah, school. Yeah. It's not busy. No, that was definitely awesome as a kid. Um, yeah. what, did you, what, did your, uh, what did your parents do? My dad was a lawyer, and my mom kind of bounced back and forth between like doing stuff at the house, being a medical assistant and, um, doing acting. Oh, okay. Just like local theater stuff and like some commercial work. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That did that. Was she continuing to do that? Like as you were obviously like growing up, like did you see her perform in plays and stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. Every once in a while. it, It was kind of something that she pursued for a while and then put on the back burner for a while and sure then dug it back up and started getting into it and then when ed and i left the house um she really dug or dove back into it um 
once she, heavily. Once she got rid of those dumb kids. Yeah, once she didn't have to take care of a couple of idiots, she uh, <laughs> she started doing that more. When, you, when she was making sure that you guys weren't trying to uh, kill each other. Right, or burn the house down. <laughs> or, yeah. Did you guys, like, because uh, you're... Did your parents always have kind of a clear idea that they wanted to have two kids, or? I think so. Yeah. I think early on they talked about having, like, an obscene number, like, five or six or something. <laughs> sure. But um, I think after they had two, they just kind of figured that that was probably time to... Yeah. This was good. Cut it off. Yeah. Right. And I think, I mean, two is a good number. I think it's a great it's number. It's manageable. And uh, Ed and I are far apart enough in age that we were never like competing for anything i feel like if you have a kid that's maybe like you know a year right removed from from the older kid there might be some competition whether it's like for sports or music or girls yeah yeah. popularity (laughs) at school and you know we were in kind of different generations um but at the same time we weren't so far removed that we couldn't relate to each other. Right. It was, yeah, it wasn't like you were, I mean, even though you were both into different things, it wasn't like there wasn't some sort of common thread that you were able to like both, you know, whatever, whether it be music, it's not like you were into the Grateful Dead. (laughs) Right. Right. (laughs) Using a terrible example. Yeah. (laughs) No, I mean, I got him into some stuff, uh, early on, like, um, some metal stuff. And then he kind of repaid me. He got into skating and surfing and started watching a bunch of skate videos and Hmm. got into a bunch of punk rock stuff. So he would actually share with me a bunch of his favorite punk rock bands, which opened my ears and mind to a whole new genre of music. That's funny because usually you don't. Usually you hear the story of the older brother influencing the younger Uh brother. And it's not like a two-way street. It's kind of just like... It, it goes he just gave hill. me all of his records. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But that's kind of funny that you were able to... Yeah, you don't hear... Well, maybe it's just because, you know, big brothers have the opinion that their little brother doesn't know anything and they're uh-huh. just like, you know, they're protecting them. And mm-hmm. you, you just don't hear that, like I said, the, it going the other way where people are like, oh yeah, like I was influenced by them as well. Yeah, well, it was nice and full give and take. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so when you... Um, like, was your guys' uh, home life pretty good? Because your, your parents were, uh, you know, they, they didn't get divorced or anything like that. No. Um, I mean, it was like any, I think any relationship, you have your ups and downs. Of and course. They definitely had their ups and downs. And um, I think anybody that doesn't admit that, it's like, oh, yeah, I had a perfect I mean, childhood. Yeah. I, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I don't care what. You know, uh, you know, even because it's like you picture Orange County and you picture Irvine, and it's like how how could it be bad? Like, right? I mean, just everything's from things perfect, perfectly manicured lawns and like nuclear family, right? And everything is all peachy. Um, yeah, I mean, there were ups and downs, but um, the downs were never so down that it was you know enough to make them split up or make us you know resent our parents or right. anything and. Um, the highs were definitely high enough to carry us through any low points there might have been. You know? Sure, sure. Did you, um, like, were you and your brother, did you guys have kind of a typical relationship in the sense of, you know, you, you beat the hell out of each other and you kind of, you know, did <sighs> did that whole thing? Or was it just kind of you both existed in your own worlds and you played with each other? Yeah. Um, you know, we got along pretty well. I think better than most siblings yeah i think just from people that i've spoken to but um only things we ever really fought over were like uh video game time and uh the remote (laughs) control those were like the most heated arguments would be i want to watch this no i want to watch this or you've been playing the game for an hour and it's my turn or something i gotta i gotta jump on now i have to beat your high school yeah no he uh he chased me around the house once with a wiffle ball bat and got a couple good, uh, <laughs> couple pretty good whacks in. Right. Um, but I, I paid him back a couple of times. Well, of course. One of my favorite stories, and this is not like a child abuse story right. because I think it makes sense. <laughs> well, it goes from brother to brother. Yeah. Um, we got into some argument and I ended up picking him up and like body slamming him on the floor and 
hurting him yeah. pretty bad. Like a like, serious body was, slam. Yeah, he was not stoked. And I was five <laughs> years older than he was. I was probably 13, maybe, Ooh, yeah. maybe 14. And he was, I guess, nine or eight. And uh, body slammed him pretty good. And uh, Did you pick that move up from the, the WWF at the time? Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Or like Olympic wrestling or something. <laughs> sure. Um, and uh, so my mom got pissed and, and probably sent me to my room. I can't really remember. But uh, And then it was the you know typical situation, like, well, just wait till your dad gets home. Right. So dad gets home from work and mom kind of fills him in on the situation. So my dad comes downstairs and I'm like, oh, fuck. I'm yeah. so, I'm this so is it. dead. Yep. So he said, what did you do to your brother? And I said, uh, you know, I, I body slammed him. He was pissing me off or something. <laughs> And he grabbed me and body slammed me. That is amazing. <laughs> and it hurt like hell. And I, I think I probably started crying. And he was like, how does that feel? Yeah. And I was like, you know, crying. Horrible. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, so why would you do that to your brother? And I was like, the light yeah. goes on. I'm like, oh, wow. Why did I do that? That was really stupid. But, this is the learning moment. You know, some people are like, oh, you know, don't, don't hit your kids or... Uh, you know, whatever. But I yeah. think that was a lesson. I mean, that I can remember it that this vividly. Of now, course, it made a mark on me in a positive way because it taught me that you know you shouldn't do something to somebody that you wouldn't want them to do to you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, that's like that's like the most apt punishment because it's not like I mean, clearly, clearly, your father wasn't like, oh, I can't wait to hurt Riley. Like this right. is going to be great. Right. right. <laughs> Right. It's like I, I'm going to teach him a lesson by exerting this physical violence on him, but it's not, you know, it's obviously not malicious. And it's a right. whole different standpoint. Right. But. And it wasn't like he was going to break my arm right. or like break my leg or give me a concussion or anything. Right, right, it was right. A safe, safe body slam, but it's still <laughs> yeah, as, as safe as a body. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I mean, I feel like that was way more effective than being like go to your room for four hours or right. something. So you, yeah, go think on that. Yeah, go think about it. You're freaking 13 years old. You're not thinking. Yeah. You just sit in your room and stew and hate. And right. You just end up getting pissed off, and then you don't really learn what you should, I feel like, from that situation. So Yeah, for sure. Those are And those are the moments where it's just like, you know, as – as a parent handbook goes, like clearly you would never read that anywhere. Like no, you would never read that as a recommendation. Especially not now. Right. Like if you told somebody that, they'd be like, oh, well, we need to lock that man up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Horrible> father. <laughs> but it's like that. I mean, that's the type of stuff where it's like, you know, that that's what makes your relationships, you know, that much stronger because you do like, I remember, I have a vivid memory of my father not letting me go or be dismissed from dinner because I didn't eat my salad. And mm -hmm. so he was like, you're going to eat your fucking salad. Mm -hmm. And I, little dick that I was when I was eight or nine years old, mm -hmm. you know, like ate half of it and then threw it up into my glass of milk. And he was like, <laughs> you're not going to eat the rest of your dinner. And it's like that, like you said, it's like I could probably still taste that salad, like thinking right. about it hard enough. Totally. And it was like, and it's just, I always made jokes with him where it's just like, you know, when I became vegetarian when I was like 16, I was like, dad, that event probably made me yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he was like i don't think so he's like you were really pissed <laughs> yeah. now all i really eat is salad then <laughs> yeah. it's like that is the only thing i eat all because of you yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um so as you were uh you know as you were growing up and going to where'd you go to high school then did you go to i went to university university yeah uh did you graduate with zach de la roca <laughs> uh i did not i think he was a few years before you probably. Yeah, he might have been a senior when I was a freshman, but I don't even know if he was still a student at uni. Yeah. He was a student at uni, and then um, I don't know if he went to self or something or sure. dropped out or right. what. But I think uh, Zach and Tim from Rage Against the Machine both. Oh, I didn't know Tim. Yeah. And didn't Will Ferrell as well? Yep. <laughs> Yeah, I love how it's like that school just has those random like, you know, five or ten people where it's just like, wait, what? Like, yeah. yeah. You would never think that of, I mean, because Irvine, like he's, we were referencing earlier, it's just kind of this random suburb and totally. it has turned out a lot of people yeah. from different walks <laughs> of life. Irvine. Yeah, exactly. Um, so d when did you start kind of becoming exposed, like, you know... Did your parents have any influence on you in regards to, you know, your musical interest or kind of, you know, what sort of started to peel away those layers? Uh, 
they kind of forced me to play trumpet when oh. I was in elementary school. I mean, they wanted me to play an instrument, and I right. chose trumpet. I'm not really sure why. Because yeah. it <laughs> seemed simple. They were like, <laughs> You're only, like <laughs> only three little thingies, three <laughs> valves to push down, and you just blow into the thing. Right. Or um, it's like, I'm going to... Exp- I always found, like, because I, I was forced to play clarinet, which mm-hmm. that was, like, fifth grade or something. And, I mean, it was a terrible idea because the only reason my mom did it was because she owned a clarinet already. And uh-huh. so she was like, oh, well, clearly he can play my old clarinet. But it's like, I have asthma. It's like, good good job. <laughs> like, way to pick yeah. the most terrible instrument yeah. as far as lung capacity yeah. is concerned. But I, I, in my own mind, I was like, if my parents forced me to play an instrument... I would pick the most expensive instrument possible. <laughs> That's just yeah. as like a, just to get them back, right? Just to get them back. But so, so it's like a, I think a trumpet is. I mean, it's it's pretty expensive, but it's not as expensive as like a tuba or something like that. Right. right. Did that did, was that was that thought in your mind where it's like because you, obviously you were forced. You didn't really like. Did your parents kind of lay it out where it's like you choose an instrument? And you kind of were like, uh, I guess I'll do this. Uh, <laughs> I don't think. I don't think I was that pissed about it. Yeah. I mean, they really wanted me to do it. It wasn't something that I had a burning really desire about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but I, I did it. Sure. And then... Um, How long did you play that for? I played it for three years, maybe four years. Wow. And I ended up liking it, but I didn't like it from a musical standpoint. I liked it from like a competitive standpoint. Oh. I thought you were going to say pick it up on girls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was just real... <laughs> Rolling in, Rolling in babes. women's, yes. Because you're like, I'm going to get to the first chair and they're going to obviously love me. Yeah. But, um, I mean, I had grown up playing sports and um, I kind of took the competitive nature that I liked in sports and applied mm-hmm. that to, you know, trumpet lessons and, right. and that class. And, well, that's what you knew. Yeah. Yeah. And so got really really driven to be first chair and got there a few times and then when i got booted i got really pissed right. so it was nice from a i guess feeding that competitive fire but sure. um but also stressed me out a lot too. i can imagine because i wanted to be really really good and if yeah. i wasn't really good uh bummed me out where where did that like do you think that drive solely came out of the fact that you know you were introduced like when did you start playing sports competitively as a kid was it i mean was baseball the the introduction to that uh baseball and soccer okay when i was like five i think that yeah. was like the the earliest that kids played back then right now they have like kids playing t-ball when they're like three or it's ridiculous so it's crazy um, <laughs> yeah. i'm but... glad that i'm glad they're not putting them on the mound though yeah, where kids are throwing out their arm or their throw a curveball. Yeah. <laughs> Remember when you had an elbow? Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. so, um, yeah. Started playing sports when I was five, and uh, just loved it. I mean, I was a huge baseball fan. You know, some of my earliest memories are watching baseball games with my dad. Yeah. on TV. Did um, your dad ever coach you when you were coming? Oh up? yeah, yeah, nice. A lot, yeah, both in soccer and uh, and baseball, and. Uh, I just loved the like the community in baseball. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, got to play with a bunch of my friends, and just the the concept of teamwork and you know working with other people towards a greater goal. Obviously, I wanted to do well for myself, but mm-hmm. I wanted to do well for myself because it would help. Right, the my, team, my right. friends. You would team. you would win if you worked together. Right. Um, so yeah, I loved that. And was your dad uh, was your dad super competitive? Um. Or did he just encourage your competitiveness? <laughs> I think he encouraged it, but I think he did a really good job of balancing the competitive side and the teamwork side and kind of the the thing that's become, I think, overly pop- popular now, which is the, like, everyone plays, everybody wins, everybody gets an award kind right. of thing. Right. He did a really good job of balancing it where it wasn't, you know, if you screwed up, he'd let you know, but he wasn't just going to hand out trophies to everybody who shows up. They sucked. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there was a push to be good at what we were doing, but there was also um, a push towards more than just winning and losing. It was making friends and working together and um, working hard and making yourself well-rounded as a player. Right. Yeah. There wasn't like one ultimate goal and everything else fell to the wayside. Right. Yeah. 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 
Um, so then with trumpet, like, did that pave the way? Like you, I presume, obviously learned how to read music through that. <laughs> yeah. And then forgot right. how to read music. So when, when did, uh, like when did drums and kind of, you know, like independent music come into play for you? Um, drums came my senior year of high school. Oh, okay. Um, I was playing baseball, basketball, no. Basketball kind of came and went in high school. Yeah. Basketball, <laughs> or baseball, soccer, and football. Oh, and, wow. Uh, I had wanted to play football for years, like since like Pop Warner days, and my parents would never let me play. Okay. They're like, you're going to get hurt. Right. You're going to get hurt. <laughs> and uh, I begged and begged and begged. And then when I was in high school, um, the baseball coach was also one of the football coaches. Okay. And he liked what I could do athletically. And he's like, you know, you would be a great wide receiver or defensive back. So he started pushing really hard. And I, you know, I already really wanted to play football. And then I had this coach in my ear that was like, we need you. We really want you out there. You could be a great football player. Yeah. So I went like full bore to try to get my parents to let me to play. And uh, I ended up writing them like a persuasive essay. Really? Yes, which is insanely nerdy. What? But I wrote them like a long letter and explained like why I wanted to do this and right. how I was going to, you know. It, this wasn't just like something that you just kind of thought of. Like this would be cool if I did this. You're like, no, here are the 10 reasons why I should do this. Right, right. I, and I sat around thinking about that all the time. Like I wanted to play football for years. So when it came time to like go for the hard sell, I was like, all right, I'm writing a persuasive essay and I'm going <laughs> to get them to let me play football. And, um, I think they caved probably just because they were wanting me to shut the fuck yeah, up. Yeah, so out of sheer desperation, like, is, is Riley it. ever going to stop talking about yeah, this? Yeah, give it a rest. <laughs> Our son's 35 now, and he's still <laughs> asking us if he could play football. Now, um, so they finally let me play. I played um, half of my junior season, and then going into my senior year, uh, we were doing this like passing league, which is just for like receivers, running okay. backs and quarterbacks um, up in Watts. And it was like with a bunch of different high schools and uh, we were playing Loyola, which mm -hmm. is like basically modern day, but in sure. LA. So it's like super competitive. Th they're all right at sports. Yeah. <laughs> so we were totally overmatched in this passing league game. And uh, some huge guy was playing corner. I was playing wide receiver and, mm -hmm. uh, Ran this deep route, and after he had been throwing me around like the entire game, I ended up beating him deep, and our quarterback threw a horrible pass, and I jumped up to catch it, and as I came down, I didn't catch it, right. as I came down straight-legged on my right leg, oh. um, the free safety came over, and this is in a flag game, hit me. Oh, nice. And basically folded my knee in half right. the wrong way. And I tore my ACL, my MCL, and partially tore my PCL. So for those of you that don't know knee anatomy, that's like pretty much everything. Right. I mean, that's your entire knee. Yeah. So um, so that, that began your career with your uh, the, the knee problems that you have obviously encountered. Yes, yes. yes. Um, so I had to have reconstructive surgery, and I couldn't play sports for like uh, – I think it was supposed to be 12 months. I ended up having to sign a waiver after nine months because I really needed to play and really wanted to play. Yeah. Because I was missing my entire senior baseball season. Sure. And I wanted to play in college. And did that did that injury just completely ruin you? Like, were you did you know you like fall into a state of depression or anything like that, or were you just yeah. like, or did you kind of focus on trying to rehabilitate yourself? I mean, I was focused on on rehabilitating myself and and really wanted to get back to play, but you know when sports is like everything to you yeah. and it gets taken away, uh, it's a tough thing to deal with, especially I felt bad too, because it was like my stupid decision that led to putting me in a situation. And like my parents never said, I told you so, but it was definitely an, I told you so moment. And I felt right. bad about that. And, um, when I was hurt, I was like half laughing and half crying sure. just because I was so bummed. I knew it was bad. Right. And laughing at like how, how stupid is... this is and like, fuck me. Yeah. Like, like this happened. On. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
So, uh, because I couldn't play sports for like 10 months, sure. um, I needed something to do and I was always drawn to the, the rhythm in music mm -hmm. and drawn to drumming, whether it was in rock music or like hip hop stuff. Sure. Um, and much to my parents and neighbors dismay. Uh, we ended up buying a drum set out of the recycler, which was like the print version of, of Craigslist. Craigslist. Right, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, back in the old days. And um, got a drum kit, and that was something. I liked the physical aspect of it, sure, because it made me feel like I wasn't just sitting around watching TV when I wasn't at a rehab for my knee. And, right. Uh, and that's how I started playing drums. And so the uh, by that time you already had been introduced via like you know your friends or whatever to like you know independent music. Like, had you been going to shows in high school at all, or was it? Um, uh, well, I mean, obviously because the sports took up so much time. Yeah, not I wasn't really involved in in independent music at that time. Sure. I was more into classic rock and mm -hmm. metal. And hip hop and R and B. Sure. And well, R and B is a, a prerequisite. Yeah. If you if you grow up in the nineties, that, yeah, yeah. that has to be. Um, yeah, I didn't really get into the the indie stuff until, I guess it was kind of around the same time that I started playing drums. Okay. I started getting interested in being in a band, which got me into. Um, finding out where bands could play around here. Right. And, and then so I just started exploring. And then at the same time, Ed was kind of getting into the skating and surfing stuff and started bringing these videos home that we would watch. And the soundtracks of those was like, you know, Pennywise and Unwritten Law yeah. and Ignite. And sure. Um, so that's when I kind of started exploring independent music and punk rock and hardcore and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Did, um, like, was your... Because obviously people the when the idea of like playing with your sibling comes up mm -hmm. where it's like people would be like oh fuck no it's terrible like why would i want to do that yeah. even if they're like tremendously close like obviously you and your brother uh -huh. are um so it's like when you know the idea started to come up like did you guys were you guys always like hey whatever we do together like musically like you know let's let's like play in a band and like let's do this together or did it just happen to match up that you guys were both kind of doing the same thing and are just like, well, since we're here together. <laughs> no, uh, I mean, I played drums, started playing drums my senior year of high school mm -hmm. and started a really, really shitty band with some of my friends, but it was like the, please tell me, please tell me it had a really good name. What was the name of it? Uh, Loose Nuts. Oh my God. Of course it had a great name. I, I mean, that's like, that's spectacular. Yeah. You can't not have a first band and have like a really good name. Yeah. That just doesn't happen. That... That incarnation of that band was playing really bad, like, Rush and Pearl Jam inspired, like, 90s Wow. Rock. Okay. Yeah. Because Loose Nuts, I would imagine, sounding like Gutter Mouth. But yeah. Obviously. No, no. It wasn't, wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. But if there's anything you want to do when you're just figuring out how to play your instrument is try to play like Rush because... Because <laughs> nothing's easier. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just power chords for like 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that uh, ended up turning into a band called Mad Rise, which was a punk rock band that was influenced by Bad Religion and Pennywise and No Effects. Got and it. We played around locally. Some did like the... Malone's shows oh, nice. and the pay to play at the whiskey. And, sure. Um, were the end of these were dudes that like you know from high hot. school and stuff like that? Yeah. Okay. They were like my best friends from high school and elementary school. Nice. Okay. Um, so then we all went away to college and the band fell apart and, you know, we'd get together and jam on, you know, spring break and stuff right, like that. Right. But we were pretty much done. And when I was, at school at Pepperdine, I couldn't play drums because I lived in an apartment. So I just kind of gave up playing drums. Sure. And just refocused on sports. Again sure. And because you, baseball and right. Cause you, you got into, to back it up a little bit, like you got into Pepperdine to like, did you get a scholarship there to play baseball or you no, just, I went walked as on. a student and ended up walking on. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And, um, so then let's see. Came home my junior year of high school or college and went to Golden West for a year to play 
to know that I could play every day and try to get a scholarship to play somewhere. Got it. Um, reunited with the guys in Mad Rise and started playing a little bit. Mm -hmm. Stopped playing with those guys again. Answered an ad at uh, Vinyl's Solution and started singing for a band. Really? I, I had no idea. Was yeah. it one of those like tearaway ads that you see, like a person's phone number? Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Spectacular. And I think it was like punk rock, like influenced by Strung Out. A everything you were into. Pretty much, yeah. Um, and I wasn't really super into the idea of, of playing drums again, just because I had nowhere to play them, really. Right. And it didn't seem practical. So I'm like, well, maybe I could sing. Sure. So I did that for about a year, a year and a half. Please tell me that you, do you have video footage of you singing for said band? I what was the name of this band? Uh, it was called Hindsight. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I don't know. That sounds familiar, but then... Well, there were probably like 150 bands <laughs> called Hindsight. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I think I saw a few of their demos filter through Bionic Records. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually found a demo of it uh, like about a month ago. When I was cleaning out my, my mom's house. <laughs> Your and, old stuff. Holy yeah. crap. Yeah. That's incredible. Well, at least you have some documentation of it. Yeah. I'm, I'm probably going to burn that. <laughs> but, um, yeah. And then uh, that band kind of took a dump and I wasn't really doing much of anything except going to school sure. and trying to still play baseball. Then I quit playing baseball and um, mm -hmm. right around that time was when... Ed hit me up and was like, hey, you know, my friend Tepe uh, has this friend Dustin that he goes to high school with, and they've been talking about starting a band, and I'm going to buy a bass and play bass, and we don't really have a drummer. Um, do you, would you be into, like, jamming with us just until we find somebody? Right. I was like, sure. <laughs> just until we find... Yeah. Lo I love those words. Yeah. Just until we find somebody. Yeah. I mean, they didn't think I was going to be interested in doing it Right. More than once or twice to just like help them out because I mean I had other stuff going on. They were all in high school and Right. You're like, Yeah, this um, this isn't this isn't my end game. Yeah. Uh, I'm like, <laughs> Yeah, you know, I'll get home from class and like go hang out with my brother and his buddies and, and play some songs. It'll be fun. So right, right. Started doing that and and had a really good time with it and fourteen years later I'm right. sitting in a chair here. <laughs> <laughs> and then fa and then fast forward. Yeah. Um so like when you uh, when you made the decision, like you made obviously a definitive decision to stop, you know, playing baseball. Um, mm -hmm. What you know, what went through your head? Where it was it basically just like, all right, I know that I can't do this for you know, like a career standpoint, or mm -hmm. was this just like you know something basically like I I can't dedicate as much time as I'd like to to it, or was it kind of a combination of a few things? It was it was a little bit of both. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it was starting to dawn on me. I thought I had an outside chance of getting drafted after my year at Golden West. Sure. And it didn't happen, largely due in part to me sucking at all the wrong times. Like, oh. anytime my coach would be like, oh, yeah, there's a scout from Houston or Texas or so-and-so here before the game, which is, like, the worst the thing, worst thing to hear. And I'm not, I'm not really good with pressure. Sure. So I, I hear that, and my butt just goes... <laughs> <laughs> I'm like so nervous and blowing it and then like that that those would be the games like make an error, strike out. Right. Uh just have horrible games and um I'm super hard on myself, whether it's music or sports and so if I got into like a little bit of a slump, I'd have like the hardest time getting out of my own head. Sure. And um that ended up kind of costing me. Um so it was becoming clear that this wasn't something that I was going to be able to do outside of college. Right. If even college beyond like the junior college level. Sure, sure. So I ended up going to Long Beach State. Um, they told me that I would have a really good shot at playing second base. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of liked that opportunity. I had friends that went there. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got there. I got my class load as an English major and realized I was going to have to read like a billion books <laughs> yeah. and write all these papers. And we had baseball workouts at six in the morning and practice from noon to four or five or something. And then right. it was just dawning on me, like if I want to apply myself to school, I'm going to have to slack 
in baseball. Sure. And if I slack in baseball, I'm going to end up sitting on the bench again, working my ass off. To sit on the to bench. To sit on the bench, which is what I did at Pepperdine, which is why I left Pepperdine. Right, so, right. Um, at that point, I was just like, you know what? I need to focus on one thing right, right. now and put myself into it. So I focused on school and said bye to baseball. And it was really, really hard. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, anytime you have to give up a, you know, whatever, a professional passion, it's like, I mean, it's, it's hard. It's, yeah. it, it, but obviously it's like, that's what builds, you know, I mean, it's cheesy sense. That's what builds the character where it's just like, at, at least you had the wherewithal to not half-ass both things and then yeah. be looking back and be like, oh, so like, I don't even have a college degree. I don't even know what I'm doing with yeah. that. And I don't have anything to show from like a baseball perspective. Yeah. I'm not a fantastic multitasker. <laughs> like, <laughs> if I have a project that I can put myself into a hundred percent, I feel really good about my ability to do that, execute and do that. It well. Yeah. But when it's you know five, six things pulling you in different directions, that's where it becomes tough to. I guess, balance time and balance effort. Of and course. Like if you're taking time away from one thing, how is that affecting the other? And mm -hmm. So you're not truly giving your hundred percent anywhere. You're yeah. giving like little fractions of that. So yeah, yeah, that was tough for me to, to let go of, but definitely something that needed to happen at that time. Sure. And, um, and I, mean, I think that it happened on my terms, I guess. Yeah. In a way, like sure. I was the one that was like, I need to stop this now. Right. Um, made it a little bit easier to to swallow, I guess. Sure. Instead of just like maybe playing out my, you know, junior and senior year of college and um, coming to the end of the road there, not getting drafted and being like, okay, well now I I can't play. Right. Like, Someone else telling you you play. can't do it as opposed to you just pulling the right. cord on your right. own. It yeah. was easier to deal with that way. Yeah. It's, uh, you, can, you can obviously compartmentalize that I do it easier because it's been generated by you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then obviously with that, you know, you were able to kind of focus on, you know, the passion that you had with English that, you know, did like, were you always interested in writing and like expressing yourself that way? I always enjoyed writing, but the way I ended up starting uh, on the course of uh, an English degree was really stupid. Um, when I ended up deciding I was going to go to Long Beach, mm -hmm. uh, it was super late in the process, like late in the, that summer uh, before uh, my first year there. And because I had a few choices of where I could go to school, like coaches that were interested, like sure. Cal State Fullerton and SC and uh, going back to Pepperdine, okay. uh, Loyola Marymount. And I'm not the greatest decision maker either. Like when you have like five Pretty amazing opportunities in front of you. It's like, which one is the right one? I yeah. don't know which the right one. The choice is crippling. Right yeah, yeah. So I was just like, ah, <laughs> shit. And then at the last minute, I'm like, my friends go to Long Beach State. I had a girlfriend at the time that went to Long Beach State. I'm like, I'll just go to Long Beach. Right. At Pepperdine, I was a telecommunications major, like majoring in radio and TV stuff. Oh, sure. And that was kind of my passion. And I let it go when I left Pepperdine to pursue baseball. Mm -hmm. uh, did not <laughs> did not take into account that Long Beach doesn't have a telecommunications program. Right. Oops. Uh, whoops. Yeah. And uh, they do have a radio station, which I, I did some work at, but um, yeah, they don't, don't have, have a legit program. Right. Right. I'm like, oh shit, what am I going to get? A What's closest yet? to that? Yeah. So I sit down with the athletic academic advisor, and she's like. <laughs> you got A's in English at Pepperdine. Do you want to get an English degree? And I was, at that point, I was so frazzled from trying to figure out what I was going to do with the next two years of my life. Yeah. And like, Someone uh, else makes a I'm decision like, for me. English? I got A's? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, let's just do that. I got it. We got to do this. Like, we're... Uh, I'm all in. Yeah. Yeah. Time's running out on this clock. I got... Let's just do it. So I did it. And uh, yeah, now I have an English degree, which is awesome because everybody wants to hire English degree. Right. <laughs> People with English degree. Exactly. Um, oh, you can write? That's, yeah. That's awesome. That's, that's perfect. Cool. Uh, that's exactly what we need here. You can write a short story. Um, that's wonderful. Do you want to be a teacher? 
Yes. Uh, yeah, because yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what my, my wife is an English degree, and that's like, I was always making fun of her in, in college, because that's what she was doing. She went to Long Beach State and did the same exact thing, uh-huh. and I was always like, so you're going to be a teacher? Like, that's literally the knee-jerk <laughs> response from everybody. It's like, yeah. oh, English degree, so you're going to be a teacher, right? Yeah. It's like, well, no. It's like, well, what are you going to do? It's like, well, I, uh, I don't know, something. Like, yeah. Something with the written word. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, fortunately, obviously, with, in this day and age, there's obviously a lot of different things that you can do <clears throat> to build yourself as a writer. I mean, obviously, like, freelance work is always there and that type right. of stuff. But there's more avenues in which to express yourself. But obviously, there's always a problem of, you know, trying to find a, a living out of it. But <laughs> totally. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then, obviously, in conjunction with all that, you were doing, um, you know, Thrice was obviously starting to, you know, play shows and that type of stuff. Like, did the, because a lot of people, you know, especially kids that are, you know, around anywhere between like 18 to 25, mm-hmm. don't have the concept of, they have the concept of playing music for fun, but the concept of like, you know, when we both started our bands of like, you know, you, you were career minded, like. So it wasn't like, all right, we got to lock in a manager, a booking agent. Right, right. Like, cause, I mean, and clearly, I'm imagining Thrice started from that standpoint as well, where it was like, like literally, we're just playing. Yeah. Let's just play. Let's get together after work or school and jam and write some songs and maybe we'll record them. Right. And wouldn't it be cool if we could get a sh- on a show at Chain Reaction right. or something? That was it. Yeah. It it's like the the... What I always find funny, too, it's like, you know, the goals start so ambitiously with bands these days where it's oh, like, yeah. I we need to achieve this, you know, huge tentpole. Like, this is where we're going to go. Right. And let's work backwards from there. Where it's like, we, the concept of what we were doing was like, we were lucky enough to put one foot in front of the other. Where it's right. like, the goal is like, literally right in front of us. Like, yeah. we just need to accomplish, like you said, like, Let's book a recording studio time. And like right. that was like, yeah, we're the studio. <laughs> like, yeah, what? Totally, totally. And so, yeah, I just think it's it's just always funny how that that concept still like you know it's becoming further and further removed. I mean, obviously there are people that you know it's just it's easier to get your music out there, so there's yeah. not as much like stress from the you know the one foot in front of the other standpoint. Yeah, but um, yeah, it's definitely that's why I feel like maybe there's you know, so much turnover in band members now and even just bands, like to see bands that are around for like two years because yeah. they're like, well, here's our goal, like uh, 2,000 miles away. Yeah. And if we don't get there in two years, then fuck it, I'll start a new band. They're like, I don't care. Like, we'll break this band up. I'm over it. Right. It's like, dude, you're not, you haven't put in any time, you know? <laughs> you don't just like latch on to this thing and then, Get enormous, right? Right. I guess. I mean, I guess you can. But you that's can. Like a major outlier, like, right? That never happened. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's you know one out of you know every ten to twenty thousand bands from a specific area. Not just right. talking about the country, right? Um. So yeah, obviously, as Thrice started to you know cut your teeth locally and you know play out and that type of stuff, it you know did did all the dudes um kind of have that sort of independent music you know, background in the sense of like, were they going to shows and stuff like that? Um, you know, like, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there was a, there was a context for, like you said, what you wanted to do, like play chain reaction and that type of stuff. Yeah. Um, when did you, when did you know, cause obviously like you said, you were just basically doing it to fill in until they found someone yeah. more regular. Like when did, uh, you know, did they have the actual conversation where it's just like, your brother came up to you and was like, hey, so do you want to be in this band? Yeah. Like, when did that happen? Like the Robert Trujillo, uh, some kind of monster. <laughs> exactly. We're, did you we're going to give you a million dollars to play in Thrice, bro. Are you in? <laughs> Let me think. Let me think Let me think that. on that for a second. No, uh, I, I can't remember one specific moment where they were like, you're in the band. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. You've made the cut. Because obviously yeah. that wasn't like, you weren't auditioning for it. Yeah. It was just, you were merely a placeholder. So Yeah, I think... I mean, we just kept writing songs and then started to play shows, whether it was like at a community center or like some dude's garage. Right. um, Yeah, I distinctly remember seeing you guys at like an Irvine community center. I think that was one of the first times that I had met all of you collectively was at a random like, I want to say it was with Slick Shoes. Oh, yeah. It was like a, that was, and it's so funny because it's like the concept of having shows outside of a venue in Southern California, like don't exist. You know, it's like. You hear in the East Coast, like, you know, basement shows, VFW halls, like, that's easier. Yeah. But it's, like, the fact that if we, we could put together, like, a community center 
allowing like punk bands to play. I mean, that's yeah. like you know you're pulling tea. It's like a, a small miracle that it happened. Oh, totally. Yeah. <laughs> but I distinctly remember that was probably I think one of the first times I met all of you guys collectively and been like, oh, like I see what they're doing and where they're coming from, mm-hmm. and you know they're obviously just trying to you know rip off all the Fat Records bands totally. and be a little bit a little bit more metalish, so to speak. Exactly. <laughs> exactly where our heads were at <laughs> which which was i mean obviously it's like to the charm of thrice and i use the word charm not in a pejorative mm-hmm. <laughs> because it's like you guys obviously through the duration of your career it's like you've never been unapologetic about what influences you and why you create the music that you do mm-hmm. i always thought that was really special because so many bands are so concerned about um, I mean, they'll, you know, whatever, a band that obviously like looks like an 80s hair metal band, like, uh-huh. they obviously like, you know, of course I love Skid Row and Poison, like right. that's easy, but it's like, you know, the nuances that make them who they are, like they're not as willing to admit that right? because yeah. it's like style, but you guys have always been like, oh yeah, like totally, like we, you know, we ripped that off. Like, you I mean, you mentioned your liner notes where it's like, oh yeah, we were directly influenced because we liked Kill Switch Engage in this song or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Like, was that, that was always, like, pretty conscious of you guys that, like, we want to show, like, where we've come from or what we're listening to currently? I think so. I mean, I don't know, just to be honest yeah. and, and open about stuff. Like, I I don't see any shame in saying, like, I was listening to a ton of Mogwai and then started <laughs> writing stuff that sounds kind of like Mogwai and, <laughs> yeah. and tried to shoehorn it into this Thrice song. Like, that's where it came from. Not, like... Yeah, you know, I just came up with this amazing idea out of thin air or something. Or... <laughs> it was in a bubble. I wasn't listening yeah. to any music. Yeah. I was re- I was simply reading Kurt Vonnegut, and I was able to translate yeah. that. Into... Oh, it's this beautiful film. I was so inspired. <laughs> that I read this riff. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, I think being honest about where the source of your material lies is... Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I agree. And I, I, that's why I always, I always am curious about people that do find some sort of weirdness where it's like they don't want to initially put it out there. I mean, they put like, you know, the A-list influence up top, but then mm-hmm. it's like, you know, the B and C list. It's like they're they're less, uh, you know, forthcoming when it comes to that information. Right, right. And on that same note, it was funny. I was actually listening to an interview with... Um, uh, Ronnie Radke, the singer of Falling in Reverse and Escape the Fates. Oh, wow. Yeah. And what was, what struck me as hilarious is, um, you know, he was talking about his, like his upbringing musically and he saw you guys at like Huntridge and basically oh, wow. this was like him, you know, signifying like, he's like, yeah, you know, like all the earlier bands and like early incarnations of Escape the Fate were heavily influenced by Thrice. And it oh. just got, it got me thinking where it was like, I mean, clearly like, you know, not judging him as a character or anything like that because, uh-huh. you know, whatever, he's obviously successful in his own right, but he could not be further removed from you guys as individuals, <laughs> which, I mean, I think anybody that can obviously see that would agree. Right. I don't, I don't know much about him, but from what I've read, I would say that, yeah, that right. is correct. Yeah. And so I find it so interesting that it's like, you know, you guys as a band, because you've existed for so long, that the influence is far spanned places that obviously it's not like you know when you were playing community center shows that you're just like i can't wait to be an influential band but right. that your influence has gone so far into so many different you know sub genres and categories that you're just like like it, you know in some ways i'm sure there's parts where you're just like i wish we could take that part back like i wish we didn't influence that band <laughs> <laughs> just based on the fact that like you know they're whatever you musically can't stand what they do or uh-huh. whatever the case may be um but, you know, does that, considering, you know, you guys are obviously preparing for, like, your farewell, to, farewell tour and stuff like that, does that kind of, you know, will that solidify more in your mind, like, you know, a few years from now? Or does that kind of, you know, has that come up more where it's, like, obviously kids approaching you at shows and that type of stuff, you uh-huh. know? How does, the, uh, how does the whole influential, you know, lifetime achievement award mm-hmm. winning thrice, wow. like, how does that sit in your head? Is it just... Uh... It's weird. Sure. Um, I mean, if it was normal, you'd be weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, that's exactly what I was expecting. Yeah. I mean, obviously. No. Um, it seemed pretty surreal. I feel like the Lifetime Achievement Award or whatever, Impact Award or something yeah. was kind of 
I mean, I get, I'm, I guess we've had an impact on, on bands, but it seemed to me, and this is not to take anything away from the award. Oh, of course not. Uh, almost like, uh, yeah, we know you're breaking up or, or going on hiatus. Here's kind of like a thank you or something. Right, right, which right. Which is very kind. Of course. Of, of those people that do. Um, cause like, I mean, other impact award winners were like freaking social distortion, right. who's been an iconic band, almost right. like a fucking brand. Right. It's like a lifestyle. Yeah, right. It's right. a lifestyle. They've been around for 30 years and we've kind of been this like schizophrenic band that never really got all that huge. Sure. Like, uh, that just kind of like floated just off the mainstream radar, I guess, for a right. long time, but never really broke through. Sure. Um, so it seems weird to be included in the same, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. category of recognition as a band like Social D, or even like a band like Sugar Ray, who won it, who their song was, or yeah. the albums were enormous of course like, that's the summer of 1995 yeah, multiple platinum <laughs> right like i think the most records we've ever sold is like 400 something right like for artists in the ambulance is artists in an ambulance nearing gold at this point um you probably will receive it in the next year or so no the no 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 not that close <laughs> oh, okay. it's close if you think about it like number wise but in how it would what what it would take to get it there sure. now is pretty much impossible. Right. We, like, the the entire uh, you know not to be morbid, but the entire band would probably have to uh, pass away in a tragic accident, <laughs> yes. and then you guys would be pushed yes. over the top. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> Which I mean, yeah. I'm, obviously, I'm not wishing that on yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> the the plaque is clearly not worth yeah. that. <laughs> we can't we can't sell a hundred thousand copies of a new record. We're sure as fuck not going to sell a hundred thousand <laughs> copies of a record that came out fucking 10 years ago <laughs> right right um <clears throat> and kind of what we were talking about earlier in regards to you know the the farewell tour and stuff like that um you know the the juxtaposition of what we were saying and sort of the passionate breakup where you've got no there's no preparation involved right. versus what you guys are going through where there's a ton of preparation yeah. going on where it's, it's like, like a long roll out yeah <laughs> right this is this elongated thing which i mean i mean to be honest it's like most people who've paid attention to the band for the past two years probably you know would have seen or maybe not two years but past year mm -hmm. could have probably seen it coming in some way shape or form right like you know just you guys ramping down your tour scheduling and all that type of stuff right um and you you've always uh you know the obviously the rest of the guys in the band, I mean, when I say the rest, as in more so on, you know, Dustin and Tepe's part, where it's like, obviously they've got families. They've moved on to the quote unquote next proverbial chapter. Right. Not saying, not saying that you're a stunted adolescent or anything yeah. like that, which in some ways I'm sure you agree. Yeah. No, <laughs> which I was very true in a lot of ways. Um, and like, obviously they've, you know, their demands are at home. Whereas like, you know, mm -hmm. you and your brother have always been like, you know, we wish we could tour more. And yeah. Like, and not in a dick way where it's like, God damn it, like, yeah. Dustin and Tepe are the worst. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, so do you think, like, you know, kind of summarizing all that, do you guys, um, you know, it obviously makes you feel strange preparing for, you know, it's like you're preparing for a eulogy in some way, shape, or form. Right. Like, does that, <clears throat> has that really changed your approach as far as, you know, how you want to be seen, like, quote-unquote, going out from, like, a thrice standpoint? Hmm. I, try, I I work really hard uh, <laughs> to not think about right that just because I mean obviously I don't want to stop doing this right I really love it um, it's been sustainable for a while and I mean we haven't I think we've done like two U S tours in the last like two three years yeah. maybe which that is makes insane sense. like that's not a lot of time on the road no. Um, Comparatively speaking, of course. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'd like to like to be able to continue doing this, but that's just not happening. So right. it's a tough thing to come to grips with. Sure. Um, and it's weird thinking about like, man, this is going to be like a series of lasts mm -hmm. potentially. Like, sure. will this be the last time that I'm in Chicago? 
will this be the last time I play this song? Will this be right. the last time I see this person? Or will this be... That's true. I mean, the there's so time? much. Yeah, there's, there's so, so much. much. I mean, there are friends on the road. There are people that you work with. There are um, cities that you love and restaurants that you love. Yeah. And, um, sites you get to see out there and it's tough to, to let go of that and you know it's the sadness is bigger than just saying goodbye to the band and the music it's saying goodbye to the I guess like the lifestyle and the right. travel and the opportunity that being in a band and making music has afforded us, sure you know um, so it's been hard to hard to deal with I guess Sure. Um, to provide, I mean, it's hard to prepare to process, for something. Sure, like that. sure. Because um, like all you're doing right now is the kind of the nuts and bolts preparation, where it's like, I mean, I know you're preparing yourself mentally, but you're doing the nuts and bolts in regards to making sure that you know the set is is somewhat agreed upon and all that type of right, stuff. Right, right. And uh, you know, I'm getting in there into our or my practice space as much as I can to you know play along with songs and make sure that I'm prepared when all four of us are in the same room again to rehearse for do tour. And, um, it's weird just listening back, you know, right. a lot of songs and, um, a lot of memories attached to those songs and each, you know, each era that they came from. And, um, it like forces me to be introspective, which is something that, I tend to try to shy away from. Sure, I guess just not because it's, it's, it's difficult. And yeah, it's hard it's, to do. it's hard. I mean, it's yeah, it's not people. I, I think when it comes to like introspection, people either are or they aren't. Like right. it's, I mean, obviously, it's like a learned trait. Like you can learn to become more introspective. Right. Like either by you being kind of like forced to be. Right. Like you've got no choice because you're delving into all these memories. Um, or it's like you already are because, you know, you're like myself, like I'm an only child. So it's like uh -huh. I had no choice but to hang out with myself and think about everything yeah. that I need to do that day or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's like the, so with that being said, like, you know, you, again, if you don't feel comfortable talking about this, but like uh -huh. the, um, you know, you've made public the fact that, you know, your father passed away mm -hmm. within the past, you know, how, how long has it been now? Mm, a year and... Yeah, year and three, three months. Yeah, that's yeah. what I thought. It was like a year and a half or so. Yeah. Um, and like you and I, you know, exchanged a lot of emails in regards to um, that because my father passed away. It'll be three years in November. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like, do you see any similarities between the two? Like, you know, the past, I mean, not so much in the fact of like, you know, the, uh, the emotions that go behind it, but just the fact that, you know, Obviously, it's like the ending of one thing and then the ending of another thing. Like, you know, do you see, do you feel some similarities between that? Um, kind of. I mean, obviously, the, the finality of death and the open endedness of a hiatus are, are just completely different. different, right? But I feel like um, the similarity lies in, um, you know, that, that the hiatus and that this farewell tour has been planned for a while and just kind of like the slow wait for it to all be over. Right. Um, it reminds me a lot of my dad dealing with cancer and knowing right. that, you know, he was terminal sure. and that it was only a matter of time until he just wasn't there anymore. Right. And then, um, day to day trying to deal with, you know, how do I make today count with him or how do I make today count with the band or with the band's fans or something? And, um, knowing that that is something that is finite, even like in the band case, it might not be finite because there may be more music or a tour or whatever. Right. But right. For all intents and purposes, this is it for, this is the, the end foreseeable of the future. Right. Exactly. Um, it's tough. I mean, yeah, definitely not as tough as watching your dad die of slowly, course not but um it is tough because it's something that i've invested myself in fully for um over a decade sure right. and um it's something that i feel very fortunate to have been a part of right and it's not something that i want to lose but i am going to lose it and uh i think you just have to prepare i guess enjoy each day enjoy the days that you have left yeah make the most of those days and 
kind of look towards um, the other side of this right. journey as something positive instead of something negative. Right, exactly. Which, from the band aspect, it's way easier to do that. Of course. It's like, hey, maybe I can pursue something totally different, or you know, maybe Ed and I will make this project work that we're working on, or um, maybe I'll get into doing some like placement stuff for like TV and radio or something like that, or film. Right. Um, so there's opportunity there on the side of my dad. It's like, there's no way that I can be uh, optimistic about not having my dad around. No, yeah. It's there's just like... Yeah, there's no way that you can obviously package that up. It's like you... Uh, the I mean, from what I've witnessed and what we've spoken about, it's like, you know, the uh, the... The most important thing that I think, you know, people have to like remember, obviously, when they're, you know, reflecting upon the loss of a loved one mm -hmm. is, you know, like appreciate, like you said, appreciating that time that you did have where it's mm -hmm. just like, you know, you have these crystallized memories of, you know, you and your father experiencing, you know, baseball and like mm -hmm. having those, you know, your father body slamming you like yeah. you have those things where it's just like, you know, it's like some people you know, are unfortunate and, you know, th through either, you know, early loss or whatever, it's like they don't have those memories. Of course, they are able to create other memories with, you know, other people or what have mm -hmm. you. Um, but it's like, yeah, focusing in on that and like that's, you know, that's ultimately the only positive thing you can glean from it. You mm -hmm. know, it's like, yeah, like you said, it's like there's no... There's no way to package up. It's like, oh yeah, like there's these are more opportunities because my father passed away. It's like, no, like right. there's no opportunities. It's just the fact that I can't, right. you know, call on him or, you know... That's what kills me. Yeah. I mean, just having somebody that you love and who you trust, like, without question. Yeah. Um, that has, like, you know, 60 plus years of life experience and has, and was, like, smart enough and uh, able enough to, like, take care of and provide for the yeah. family of four um, to not have him to ask questions. Of course. Um, you know, to not be able to pick his brain about, you know, how he would handle this situation or sure. You know, no matter what it is, like if it's like relationship advice or like buying a car or yeah. like put it, making a down payment on some <laughs> sure. property or something like he was always the one to turn to. So to not have him in my life is like really hard. Like yeah. It makes you feel alone. Kind of, of, you know? 100%. But, I mean, yeah, that that's, the time that I miss, the times that I miss my father the most are when it's like something, because, you know, he didn't, he didn't live with me. He like, he, my parents were divorced at an early age and he lived in Vegas. And so mm -hmm. when monumental things happen, that's when I would call him like, oh, right. I got to, I mean, you know, I got to raise my job. Like, awesome. And it's like yeah. just that, that sharing and the camaraderie of like, you know, you, I was never seeking approval from him, but just mm -hmm. that sort of like, I'm proud of you. It's like that. I mean, you know, that uh, people that have their parents and maybe don't have a good relationship with them. That's what they're trying to do their whole life. Like you hear right. so many entertainers where it's just like, oh, I never received approval from my father. So I spent 40 years toiling, you know, trying to be an actor. Right. Just so right. I could have my father say once I was proud of you. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Um, but sort of, uh, you know, moving past that and kind of wrapping things up. Um, like you were saying, the, you know, opportunities that are afforded to you, you know, musically, professionally, whatever, like after, you know, after the thrice chapter closes, but not entirely, mm -hmm. um, you know, what are you most looking forward to? Like kind of what, what things do you have coming up? Cause I know you are, I mean, you're making music I know with your brother, which yeah. is cool. I'm sure yeah. that's kind of a, a whole different experience writing stuff with him in a whole different context. Yeah. Oh, it's exciting. Um, I feel like the, the ideas are really free flowing and um, we have kind of different musical minds, but I think there are a lot of sections of our brains that are kind of tied together um, as far as like what we enjoy and what we enjoy playing. Right. Um, so it's been fun. It's been a little slow going just because we've both been busy, but um, yeah. Well, I mean, you're preparing, like I'm yeah. sure more time will be afforded to you obviously once. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's going to be fun to really kind of set some strict goals and set a timeline and, and maybe start demoing some stuff, talking to people about collaborating and yeah, just seeing what comes of it. I mean, we don't really have like a clear cut idea of what we 
what it's going to be. Right. I mean, that's kind of what we did with Thrice, too. It's like, <laughs> that, that's what it's like when you start playing music. Yeah, you just, you just let it build itself and let it become what it's going to become. So that's exciting. Um, I'm exploring some writing opportunities, um, just reaching out to people and um, you know, seeing what kind of opportunities there might be for me to, to write on a more full-time basis and maybe get paid a little bit. Yeah, yeah, to, for sure. Do it. Like you're like you're saying, like sort of like soundtracky type stuff as well, or like. Well, that um, and then writing text, like writing. Oh, writing like writing, actual writing. the physical yeah. writing process. Yes. Yeah. No, but for the uh, the soundtracky kind of stuff, it's just um, stuff that might not work in a in a live content or mm -hmm. uh, stuff that is more ambient or lends itself to being more instrumental or electronic or something like that. Right. Um, it's still stuff that I enjoy writing and um, we'll see what happens with that. Sure. And uh, yeah, the writing of, of text, writing of words. <laughs> the the quote unquote, and I use quote unquote pen to paper because yes. clearly pen to paper doesn't happen as no, much anymore. No, it takes way too long. Yeah. Um, <laughs> looking into that and... Um, and you, have, and, you have, and you have a relationship that is obviously very uh, serious and, very and serious. blooming and uh, quite uh, quite nice because you well, you live with said uh, said person. I do, and that's uh, I'm yeah. sure that's an exciting component too. It is. It's awesome, and I'm looking to uh, you know make that, <laughs> explore make that. that more serious if that's possible. But sure, yeah. sure. Um, yeah, things are good. I mean, outside of like. Losing my job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I mean, things are, I can't complain about anything. I mean, I'm, I've been very, very lucky and very fortunate to, to right. do a lot of really cool shit. And um, I'm fortunate to have an awesome family and awesome friends and an awesome lady. And uh, yeah, you have, you have a, a supportive network. And even though you're going through, you know, something that is difficult to deal with it's like you know you're in you know like you said in some respects you know you feel alone because obviously you don't have someone like your father to immediately lean on right but you've got obviously a lot of other people to lean on to be able to you know guide you through the waters and, right yeah no i'm excited because there's a lot of opportunity in front of me i yeah. mean i'm also looking into maybe not doing anything with music and maybe not doing anything with writing and seeing if, seeing if I can get a job somewhere else yeah, or yeah. getting a job in baseball or right, because something you, like that. Because, because you've I never can. had, right. Yeah. You've never had the ability to do that. Right. Because I can and because I should. Right. So I'm going to explore every opportunity out there. Um, and in a lot of ways, it kind of feels like, you know, where I was when I was, uh, you know, 21 and trying sure. to pick a college and trying to pick a major and right. trying to figure out if I was going to keep playing baseball or what was going to happen. Right. Um, but I feel like I've learned so much and developed so many friendships and uh, grown so much as a person that it's a little easier to deal with this yeah. time around. Well, you're not you're you're <clears throat> you're not starting as a stupid 21 year old kid. Right. You're yeah. You're starting as a young adult with life experience that right. is irreplaceable. But I'm still insanely anxious about it. Right. I, of course. Well, because I think that's who you are as a person. Yeah. That's how it works. Yeah. I wake up in the middle of the night and play brain tennis for like fucking four hours. <laughs> brain tennis. That is, a, that is a spectacular word. Uh, I've never heard of that. Yeah. That, you should probably copyright that. I will. I'll make t-shirts. Yeah. Brain tennis. That's my first com. job. Brain tennis t-shirts. <laughs> 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 that's spectacular well thank you for hanging out on this fine afternoon I appreciate it thank you it. for having me it's I, always fun it's spectacularly fun thanks for listening to the first episode of 100 Words or Less the podcast you can email me at 100wordspodcast at gmail.com and you can follow me on twitter at 100wordspodcast podcast.